very first of this case, you know, there was a statement by FedEx that, hey, you know, we, we're sorry. We, we, you know, acknowledge that we did this. We want, we want to do the right thing. We, we think that she was hurt, and we want to, we want to take care of her. You've seen the entire FedEx team back there, a whole bunch of them. Not one person cared enough to take a stand and say, you know what, we did cause this crash. We're sorry about it. We think that you know she deserves to be compensated for her injuries. Instead, you didn't hear from one person of the 58,000 or 60,000, however many employees they said they had. Not one person cared enough to take a stand and apologize. Not one. So there's a big difference in actual, real accountability and coming up here to try to save money after you've destroyed somebody's life and ruined their life for the rest of their life to come up here and say, you know what, we're sorry. We, we agree that we're at fault. Okay? Actions speak much louder than words. And admitting fault and being responsible are two completely different things. When, when a little kid is playing baseball and he hits the baseball through the window, his parents don't tell him, well, just go tell him sorry, and then everything will be forgiven. No, the parents say, you broke the window, so you need to go and, and pay for it. You need to tell them that you did, that you broke it, you need to be responsible. Imagine a society that we live in if we're just allowed to break whatever we want and it doesn't matter. There's no consequence at all. So sorry, but not sorry. Sorry, but not sorry. FedEx will get up here and they will tell you that they you know, are really sorry about Nadia and sorry that all this happened. It is a ploy. They want your sympathy to make it look like they really care. They don't. They hire a guy like Howard Tongue to come in here and do what he did on that stand. So were the defenses legitimate or frivolous? During jury selection, we talk about jury trials. And whether it's a frivolous case or whether it's a frivolous defense, I ask for everybody to make room for the possibility that sometimes it's not the plaintiff that's taking advantage of the system. It's the defendant that's taking advantage of the system. They're coming in when they are clearly at fault, 100% at fault, no question about it. They absolutely destroy her. You know, 25 miles an hour, the driver admitted to it in a 50,000 pound vehicle, absolutely crush her. And then they come in and say, you know what? This is really super convenient that this second accident happened. Super convenient, aha, there's our chance to get off the hook on this situation, okay? That's what they're gonna come and argue. And as I thought about that, a story came up, it, a memory that I had when I was a kid. I was like, you know, I think 15 or 16, well, probably 16 or 17, because I was driving. And me and a couple of my friends were gonna go snowmobiling. And I had a snowmobile, a snow beat down snowmobile. And my brother's, or my best friend's brother had a really nice snowmobile, and he let us borrow that one. And he told us though, he said, his name's Danny, and he said, listen, when you're going up there, this is fresh powder. You have to make sure that the powder is packed, okay? Because if you just go up there and you're cruising around, you're gonna catch a ski under a branch, it's gonna rip the ski off, you're gonna have a lot of problems, and so forth. Well, we're 16, 17 year old kids, we know better than everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So we get on the snowmobiles, we're hauling around, and sure enough, my ski comes under this branch and rips it off. Just like what he told me. Just like what he told me. Well, so we wire it back together, limp down, get on the trailer, take it down to my house, and I go in and I tell my dad, I say, hey, you know, dad, this is what happened. Um, you know, it's my fault, Danny told me not to you know, do this. And, and, you know, my dad was cool back then. I was, I was in high school. So he just says, well, look, take it over to Orland Black, get it fixed, you know, but you've got to, you've got to handle it, you've got to take care of it. All right, I agree. So about two weeks later, my brother comes down and he doesn't know that the snowmobile's broken. 
So he hooks onto it, and he, he's just new, brand new married. All my siblings live out of the house. I'm, I'm the only one that's living at home. And he takes a snowmobile. And he goes up, and about an hour and a half later, he returns and comes in the house, and he starts telling my dad, Hey, Dad, you know, I just barely got this off the trailer. Uh, I don't know what happened. I, you know, I, I got 50 yards up the road, and my dad kind of catches me, right? He sees that, that I know that Aaron doesn't know that this happened. And so he gets my brother into a ladder. Basically, oh, I don't know, Aaron, you're the last one to use it. You know, you're the one that's responsible. It broke when you were, you were using it. My brother's protests get louder and louder and louder. And my dad's just laughing about this whole thing. And finally, he just says, he looks, he looks at my brother and says, listen, Ben's the one that broke it. He knows he's responsible. He knows he's the one that's got to fix it. It was all his fault. Okay? That's what is supposed to happen. Right? That's the right thing. It's not, it wouldn't be right for me to sit back and say, you know what? I'm going to let my brother take the hit for this because he doesn't know. So I'm going to let him take the hit. That's exactly what FedEx wants to have happen here. They know that they hit my client with a 50,000 pound semi truck, absolutely demolished her, the back of her vehicle, yet they want to say, well, you know what? It's this, it's this, uh, it's this uh, other crash that happened five months later, and we're going to confuse this and make it look like we're going to pull one record here and one record here and, and spend an entire week and a half on why this other crash should be blamed. 